Madison and its allies have decided to throw their weight behind yet another coup attempt in Venezuela. As usual, they claim that their objectives are democracy, freedom. Nothing could be farther from the truth. The following presentation will expose the real motives and human consequences of this gambit. We'll start with a quick rundown of recent events. To fully understand those events, however, will require a history lesson, a background check on the key players. On January 23, 2019, Venezuela's opposition leader Juan Guaido declared himself acting president and called upon the armed forces to disobey the government. Very few had ever heard of this man. He had never actually run for president. Guaido is the head of Venezuela's National Assembly, a position very similar to Speaker of the House. Within minutes of this declaration, U.S. President Donald Trump took to Twitter and recognized Guaido as interim president of Venezuela, writing off the administration of Nicolas Maduro as illegitimate. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo followed by urging Venezuela's military to restore democracy, affirming that the U.S. would back Mr. Guaido in his attempts to establish a government. They also promised $20 million in humanitarian aid. And to put this into context, Trump is on record saying he is not going to rule out a military option in Venezuela. This is roughly the equivalent of Nancy Pelosi or Mitch McConnell declaring themselves president, calling on the military to overthrow Trump, and having China pledge to fund and assist the effort. Now, if you happen to be in the camp that wouldn't actually mind seeing Donald Trump forcibly removed from office, I would encourage you to imagine replacing Trump's name with Obama, Bush, Merkel, or Macron. You know, there have been a lot of protests in France lately, and the Yellow Vest have demanded that Macron step down. Why don't we restore democracy in Paris? If Donald Trump can decide on a whim which leaders are legitimate and which could be deposed by tweet, what kind of precedent does that set? And who's next? The grand irony here is that the exact same media outlets that blasted Trump as a quote, illegitimate president whose election is tainted by fraud, are now calling his regime change ambitions in Venezuela bold. Not only have they refused to criticize the move, but in fact they're hailing this as a quote, potential foreign policy victory and a political win at home. Let's get this straight. Trump is an illegitimate president who should be removed from office because of Russian interference but you're perfectly comfortable with that same illegitimate president toppling foreign governments via Twitter? Though support for Guaido was quickly parroted by Washington's most dependable allies and lauded by virtually every Western media outlet, the Venezuelan military responded by condemning the coup and reconfirmed their loyalty to Maduro. Russia, China, and Turkey also issued statements condemning U.S. meddling and warned against further interference. By January 25th, Reports were flowing in that as many as 400 Russian military contractors were already on the ground. That same day, Pompeo announced that Elliot Abrams, the man who oversaw regime change wars in Nicaragua and El Salvador, was deeply involved in the Iran-Contra scandal and who was an architect of both the Iraq War and the 2002 coup attempt in Venezuela, which culminated in the kidnapping of Maduro's predecessor Hugo Chavez, would be put in charge of the effort to, quote, restore democracy and prosperity to their country. Right. So why do you suppose Washington really wants regime change in Venezuela? You'd have to be pretty naive to buy that democracy and prosperity drivel. The Trump administration slams Maduro as authoritarian while cuddling up to Mohammed bin Salman, a mass murdering dictator known to dismember reporters he doesn't like. They talk about how the Venezuelan economy is in shambles, but by their own admission, U.S. sanctions have played a significant role in creating that situation. Might the real motive have something to do with the fact that Venezuela is sitting on the world's largest proven oil reserves and that Western oil companies were kicked out of the country? Hey, how about we ask Donald Trump? With respect to Libya, I'm interested in Libya if we take the oil. If we don't take the oil, no interest. We have to have, look, if we have wars, we have to win the war. What we do is we, we take over a country and then we hand the keys to people that don't like us. I'll tell you what, Iraq, 100% Iran takes over Iraq after we leave. And what really happens with Iraq is they want the oil fields. And I have it on very good authority that Iran probably won't even be shooting a bullet because they're getting along with the Iraqi leaders better than we are. After all of those lives and after all of the money we spent. And if that's going to happen, we take the oil. Well, how do you think that would impact our relationship with other Arab countries if we go in and say, hey, we're taking the oil, or at least until we're paid back what we think we spent? How do you think that would affect the Arab nations? Who cares? 
Who cares? Maduro's predecessor, Hugo Chavez, nationalized the oil industry and used the proceeds to fund his socialist vision for the country. Now, you could make the case that his vision was flawed and horribly mismanaged. However, he had strong public support for this mandate. So much support, in fact, that when U.S.-backed coup plotters kidnapped Hugo Chavez in 2002, crowds took to the streets in mass and he was quickly reinstated. Which brings us back to Juan Guaido. There's not much information available on Mr. Guaido, but if you look up the man who tapped him to lead the opposition party, Voluntad Popular, you'll find Washington's fingerprints all over the place. Leopoldo Lopez, the founder of Voluntad Popular, orchestrated the protests in 2002 that led up to the kidnapping of Hugo Chavez. It's no secret that the U.S. has been funding Voluntad Popular for years. In fact, you can still find documents on state.gov which admit to routing at least $5 million to, quote, support political competition building efforts. Nor is it a secret that U.S. officials met with coup plotters in 2018. But if there were any doubt that Guaido is Washington's puppet, Mike Pence's call the day before the coup assuring U.S. support should lay that to rest. But Maduro is a bad leader. Compared to who? Which paragon of good governance will we refer to as the model? Trump? Theresa May? Angela Merkel? Macron? Take your time. Juan Guaido never ran for the office he claimed, and the fact that he directly colluded with a foreign nation to overthrow the man who was elected president marks him as a traitor. Juan Guaido is a puppet. If installed, he will serve the interest of those who bought his ticket. Venezuela's oil industry will be privatized, and the profits will be sucked out of the country by Western corporations. Venezuela is one of the three countries I call the Troika of tyranny. It'll make a big difference to the United States economically if we could have American oil companies really invest in and, and produce the oil uh, capabilities in uh, Venezuela. One could make the case that Maduro is incompetent. One could make the case that his economic theories are trash. The same could be said for the haircuts and suits calling for his removal. But the reality of the matter is that unless you happen to be a Venezuelan citizen, how Venezuela is governed is actually none of your business. Given how things turned out in Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Syria, and Ukraine, you'd think people would get the hint. When it comes to spreading democracy, you suck. U.S. regime change operations have left nothing but chaos, death, and destruction in their wake. If you want to make the world a better place, maybe, just maybe, you should start at home.